Thank you, Brother Stringer. Uh, what a joy it's been to know Brother Phil over these years and the, the inspiration and the blessing he's been to me. Well, as you mentioned, I'm from, uh, well, actually, I'm, I'm back in Illinois, and uh, this is home. I grew up in Illinois. My formative years were in Illinois. I, I, I've always, my, my heart just kind of flutters a little bit when I see an Illinois license plate. Of course, they're all over the place here. But <laughs> it's good to get back to uh, Illinois. Uh, I pastor the North Star Baptist Church in Duluth, Minnesota, started the church 20, almost 27 years ago. And uh, Duluth, uh, I tell people, it's the uh, People's Republic of Duluth. Uh, very liberal city. We're, we're not the end of the world, but you can see it from there. <laughs> but, uh, and I think some of you know I'll be retiring from the pastorate this uh, June after about 47 years in, in a pastoral ministry of one level or another and uh, planning to do some Bible conference work thereafter. If you would like to have a preacher in for a Bible conference, I, I can recommend one to you. But uh, uh, Brother Stringer here uh, this afternoon, now he, he, he came and reminded me that uh, Dr. King last night only spoke for 20 minutes as the first speaker on, on the evening agenda and uh, kind of hinting. And uh, Brother Stringer, where did you go? He's around here somewhere. But uh, I, I'm happy to announce for Brother Stringer's sake that I, I am planned to shorten the message tonight by about 10 or 15 seconds. <laughs> but uh, we'll just see how the Lord leads. Well, it's, it's been a blessing to be here with, with Quentin Road Bible Baptist Church and, and uh, uh, Brother uh, Scudder and what a blessing this church is and what a, what a testimony it is. And I'm honored and I'm privileged to stand in this pulpit tonight and share with you some thoughts here this evening. I've been asked to speak on the critical text versus the traditional text and uh, particularly for students here tonight. I hope that I can help you to better understand the issue. I mean, much of what's been said here in the last uh, day, some of it is technical and some of it is deep and some of it is esoteric. I'm not sure what that word means. But I would like to try and, and put it an overview on this tonight where everyone can understand the issue here this evening. I think my, my speaking tonight will be more of a lecture than a sermon It'll be more teaching than preaching this evening, though you never know, I might get to preaching. But uh, several years ago, I was talking to the dean of Bible of a Baptist Bible college in Wisconsin. Uh, southeastern Wisconsin, even, <laughs> whom I grew up with. And he said to me, well, I hear you, you're King James only. I said, no, I am traditional text only. And there is a distinction. But if you come to the, to the, the view and the conviction of being traditional text only, you will be only King James. Only King James. For many here tonight, what I will say is, is, is not new. Yet for others, hopefully this can be a help in understanding the Bible issue controversy. Now, uh, the issue is not translational. For example, someone will say, well, such and such a translation is easier to read. That's not the issue. Or someone else will say, uh, this translation is more modern. That's not the issue. Or someone else will say, well, this translation is more accurate. And by the way, that's not true, but, but people will say that. But that's not the issue. Or this particular translation is the most popular. But that's not the issue. 
And by the way, the King James Bible is still the most popularly read Bible in America. And most of these little things that I have just said are marketing ploys by publishing companies. And they have little basis in reality. But rather, the issue that, that, that all this conference has been about, the issue comes down to the textual issue. And by that, I refer to the underlying text. I guess we could say text, plural, but particularly that of the New Testament. On the one hand is the traditional text, and I'm going to talk about that and define that here a bit this evening, the traditional text from which the only major English translation is the King James Version of the Bible. The traditional text. On the other hand is the critical text from whence all the other translations come from. And some will say, well, there, there really is no difference between them. And when I was in seminary years ago, uh, the seminary professor says, well, you know, the difference between the, the critical text and, and the, that, that textus receptus thing, uh, the difference, uh, you, could, you could amount to just the, the footnotes in the bottom of a page. That is not true. Now, I'm not sure that professor was being dishonest. I don't think he was. That is just what somebody had told him, and he was repeating it to his class. There are profound differences. There are dramatic differences between the traditional text. And by the way, the traditional text is sometimes referred to as the received text, and its Latin derivation is textus receptus, uh, of which the initials TR they all are synonymous, or roughly, or basically synonymous. I prefer the term traditional text because it's been traditional from, from this day back to the church at Antioch. And on the other hand is the critical text, sometimes called the eclectic text because it's based on a, a variety of several manuscript sources. Well, this evening, without getting real technical or heavy duty this evening, I would like to share seven areas of differences between the critical text and the traditional text, because that's where the real issue is at. Uh, we can talk about whatever the, the prevailing popular translation of the day is, but from the year 1881 to the present, every major translation that come, has come down the pike has been based on the critical text. And they have that all in common. They're critical text based. And we're going to see the problems here tonight. And so seven differences between the, the critical text and the, the, the traditional texts. As, uh, well, let's start here, number one, this evening with a matter of translations. And I may be a bit redundant on occasion tonight, but repetition is the mother of learning. And I, I'm, I'm aware that we have Bible college students here tonight. And uh, you preachers bear with me because I'm preaching largely or speaking largely for their sake. Uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, there's only one major English translation of the traditional text, and that's the King James Version. And I believe the traditional text is the direct descendant of the originals, the autographs, or autographa as it's sometimes called, and the traditional text is, in fact, the Word of God. Thus, the King James Version, by extension, is the Word of God. And uh, let me just digress for a moment and get off on a little tangent for a moment. Uh, and, and folks will say, well, what about the new King James Version? Doesn't it purport to be based upon the Textus Receptus? That is the traditional text. Well, that's what it purports to be. But if you will take a New King James Bible down off the shelf and open it up to the New Testament and notice in the margin, the center margin, or the, it's technically the gutter, but that, that place in the middle where there are you know, footnotes, marginal notes, you will notice if you look at it that on page after page after page after page, virtually every page, with multiple entries, there will be the, the letters N-U, 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 N-U. You say, what's that mean? Well, that is another reference or another term, technical term, I won't go into it here tonight, but it's another technical term for the critical text. And the New King James Bible is liberally, pun intended, is 
liberally seasoned with a critical text. Now, the New King James editors had to make at least 10% changes from the, the, the old King James to get a copyright on it. The, the King James version that you and I use is not copyrighted, uh, at least here in America. And so to get a copyright, they had to make 10% changes by law. And in virtually every case in the New Testament where there were adjustments and changes made, they went to the critical text to make their changes. And for all intents and purposes, the New King James Bible is essentially a critical text translation. And so I, I diverge, got off on a tangent there for just a moment. But the, the, but the point here at this, at this juncture is that virtually all, well, let me rephrase that, the only translation, major English translation based on the traditional text is the King James Bible. We're going to talk about that here momentarily. The critical text underlies virtually all modern language translations. Yeah. All. Uh, the RV, the revised version of 1881, which was the granddaddy of all these modern translations produced by Drs. Westcott and Hort. Critical text. They are the, the modern inventors of the critical text. Uh, and then in 1901, the ASV, the American Standard Version, uh, produced by Philip Schaff and his World Parliaments of Religion. The, the beginning of the, the ecumenical movement, the beginning of the Antichrist One World Church. Philip Schaff produced the American Standard Version. When I was in seminary, we were told that it is the, uh, the bedrock of, of biblical honesty. Well, it's based on the critical text. And uh, then after World War II came the RSV, the Revised Standard Version, produced by the National Council of Churches. A critical text. And then in about 1963, along came the New American Standard Bible, at least the New Testament part of it, based on the critical text. And uh, then came uh, Good News for Modern Man, which was really bad news for modern man. And the Living Bible, and then uh, in about 1970-ish, or there, thereabout, came the NIV, which has morphed and changed several times in the last 40 years. And then came the, the, the new RSV. And, uh, and I'm, I'm just hitting not, not every, every text. There are dozens of translations, I should say, uh, based on the critical text. The ESV is a very popular one today, particularly in evangelical and even some fundamentalist circles. Uh, it's the favorite text of Bob Jones University, professing fundamentalist college. Uh, the NET, the CEV, and on and on and on, all this alphabet soup of translations have one thing in common. They're all based on the critical text. And so the translations, there, there's two very profound differences. King James Bible based on traditional text. Uh, I, on occasion I've, I've preached messages like this and I'll have a stack of various translations, modern translations. They're all based on the critical text. And so the difference, there's difference in translation. Number two this evening, uh, a second difference is the origins of the two textual lineages. The traditional text can be traced back to the church at Antioch. Now, you will recall that the church of Antioch was the Apostle Paul's home church. It was the sending church when Paul and Barnabas uh, went out as missionaries. And in the year 150 A.D., the church at Antioch, which was the principal church, the church at Jerusalem, of course, had been the mother church, and because of persecution and opposition, and, uh, and then eventually the, the destruction of, of Jerusalem by the Romans, uh, it no longer was a, a major factor, and the, the locus and the, the focus of New Testament Christianity had shifted Antioch. And in the year 150 A.D., the church at Antioch uh, in Syria produced the Peshitta translation, Peshitta being a Syrian word, which means the basic or the common translation of, of the New Testament. Sometimes it's called the Syriac translation. But what is significant about that is that the Peshitta translation follows the traditional text. 
Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that if a translation follows the traditional text, it's based on the traditional text. Now, that is not manuscript evidence, but that is translational evidence, but it's evidence nevertheless. Now, here is the mantra of the critical text crowd and, and the NIV crowd and, and the, all the, the modern translations, and their basic mantra is that their text and their translations are based on the, are you ready for this, young people, students here tonight? It's based on the oldest and best uh, manuscripts. And you hear that over and over again, the oldest and the best, which we'll see tonight are neither. But the Peshitta was translated 200 years before uh, the, the principal manuscript of the, of, of, of the critical text. The critical text evidence is not the oldest. And so we have the lineage of the uh, uh, traditional text evidence going clear back to, Man, uh, to Antioch. And that lineage through the centuries has been a lineage of missionaries and martyrs. People who have given their lives for the word of God. Missionaries on the field, such as a man by the name of Ufalus, who was a missionary to the Goths in uh, Central Europe uh, in the 300s AD. And in about 350 AD, he produced a translation on the field called the Gothic translation in the Gothic language for the Gothic tribes there of Central Europe. It was based on the traditional text. And that's interesting how a missionary on the field, uh, without the resources of libraries and and, and academia out in, in the hinterlands produced a, 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 a translation of, of the Bible from the traditional text. Tradition of the, uh, translation, I should say, of the New Testament. Well, it was the Word of God. It was the Bible. It was the New Testament. And later, uh, moving on through history, people like the, the Waldenses, not only produce texts of the scripture following the traditional text, but translations of the scripture, their traditional text. People who would be in, in some considerable measure our forefathers in church history. They all use traditional text Bibles. Later, men such as Tyndale and John Rogers gave their lives for traditional text-based translations. And that's the lineage, the transmission of the traditional text. Missionaries and martyrs. But in contrast, on the other hand, the critical text has its origins in Alexandria, Egypt. Uh, the, the, the principal manuscript of, of the, the critical text is a, a document, a volume called Codex Vaticanus. Codex is a Latin word meaning a, a volume bound on the spine, which we commonly call a book today. Prior to that time, they were in scrolls. But the, the basic document of the critical text is Codex Vaticanus. We'll talk about it a little more here a little later. And it was produced, we believe, in uh, the, from about 330 to 350 in that area uh, in Alexandria, Egypt. Now, there's significance about that geography. Alexandria, Egypt, particularly in the, the, the fourth century, was the home base for early apostates such as Origen and Eusebius. Now, you'll sometimes hear uh, Origen and Eusebius being referred to as church fathers. That is a misnomer. They were early apostates and heretics. And Eusebius, uh, they, 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 there was a seminary there in Antioch, uh, not Antioch, Alexandria, I'm sorry, called the Catechical School of Alexandria. And Origen had been the president of the, of, of the seminary, the Catechical School. When he died, Eusebius uh, took over and, and was the leader there. And uh, in, in the year 331 AD, Constantine the Great uh, who purportedly and supposedly had, had converted to Christianity. I don't think Constantine uh, was any more born again than any one of the, mo uh, the modern popes are. But Constantine commissioned Eusebius in Alexandria to produce 
50 uh, copies of the New Testament. Now today we think 50 you know, Bibles, 50 New Testaments, a big deal. Folks, it was a big deal back then because they all were hand copied manuscripts. And it was done on uh, uh, vellum or parchment, which is very expensive. That, that is uh, animal skin, calf skin, uh, lamb skin. Uh, it was estimated that one copy of, of uh, Vaticanus, for example, of those 50 manuscripts would be the equivalent of the, the lifetime wage of, of an average person of that era. But Constantine had the money and the funds. And he had learned that the New Testament was the holy book of Christianity, and so he commissioned Eusebius, president of the Catechical Seminary of, 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 of Alexandria, to produce these uh, copies of the New Testament, all hand copied. Took him some years to do it. Now, Alexandria, Egypt, in the fourth century, was uh, a center of Gnosticism which was uh, a religious and philosophical system that is, is heretical. We'll talk about it more in a moment. But here's the point. Alexandria, Egypt in the fourth century was the epicenter of apostasy and false doctrine and heresy analogous to Rome and the Vatican today. We would not consider the Vatican today to be a center of biblical truth. In fact, it's just, it's the antithesis well, so was Alexandria, Egypt in the third and fourth centuries. It was the center of false doctrine and heresy and apostasy. Now, the point is this, such is the associations of the critical text. And we have every reason to believe that the, the scribes who copied the, what, what came later to be known as Vaticanus were in fact Gnostics. And uh, later yet tonight, we'll see some of their, their influence on the text. And so, the lineage of the, 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 the traditional text is of missionaries and martyrs. The lineage and the origins of the, uh, tr uh, the, the critical text is apostasy and heresy. Now, number three tonight, a third distinction or difference, the transmission of the text. Uh, I, I touched here a moment ago how the traditional text uh, can be found in translations as early as uh, 150 in Antioch. And again, how Waldensian translations were based on the traditional text. And we come into the Renaissance era to Erasmus uh, and his contribution to the transmission of the Scripture. Uh, Erasmus was a, a Dutch scholar uh, reputed in his day to be head and shoulders above any other textual or, or uh, a biblical scholar in, in the world at that time. A brilliant man. And, uh, and, and incidentally, I've, I've had people over the years either say or write or I've read that Erasmus created the Textus Receptus. Wrong. Erasmus didn't create the Textus Receptus. What he did was put the traditional text into print for the first time in history. Prior thereto, every copy of the New Testament had been handwritten, manuscript. But in the year 1516, Erasmus produced his first edition of the printed Greek New Testament and eventually produced five editions. And, and that's significant because though there, there probably were some shortcomings in Erasmus' first edition, that they, there, there's nothing based on Erasmus' first edition, certainly not the King James Bible. And that is alleged sometimes. But it was the, the printing and the, the, the multiplication and the distribution of the Word of God that led to the Renaissance and, and then to the Reformation. It's been said by the Catholics that uh, Erasmus laid the egg, but Luther hatched it. In other words, he was the, the precursor or the forerunner of the Reformation. But again, he is working with the traditional text. Luther translated the traditional text into German. William Tyndale translated it into English. And by the way, your, your, your King James Bible today, the, uh, the, your, your Bible today is based on about 85% of the work of William Tyndale. But William Tyndale and John Rogers, his colleague, were burnt at the stake 
for their efforts to place the Bible into the hands of the common man. And once again, we're talking about a, a, a lineage of missionaries and martyrs. And of course, in the year 1611, the, the King James Bible was released. There's fascinating history, English history leading up to that, and I don't have time to go into that tonight. But of course, the King James Bible was based on the traditional text. King James translators working principally and, and primarily from Beza's fifth edition. There was a, a lineage of, of, the, of five editions of Erasmus. Uh, editions because A, there were typos and printing problems that had to be corrected, and, and, and B, he was continuing to research and, and refine and, and polish. But five editions of, of Erasmus, three editions of Stephanus, and, uh, and Beza went on to produce ten editions, but uh, we, we believe that the, the greater part of the King James translator's work was based on Beza's fifth edition. And uh, you'll hear at times people attacking Erasmus and for whatever shortcomings or problems he might have, the King James translators for the most part didn't work from Erasmus, though I think they did have access to his work. They worked from Biza. But be that as it may, there is a, a succession. And by the way, uh, the, the, in, on the English side of the, the equation, from Tyndale's translation to the King James Bible, there are seven English translations. And uh, Psalm 12, 6, the words of the Lord are pure words, purified in a furnace of earth. How many times? Seven times. That's coincidental, isn't it? Interesting. But the transmission of the critical text were scribes who, as I mentioned a few moments ago, were Gnostics. Gnosticism, and there were several varieties of it, but Gnosticism, uh, as one of its major tenets, took the view that Jesus of Nazareth was not the Christ. And their view and their position was that anything that was material, whether it was uh, wood or, or flesh and bone, was evil, and because Jesus of Nazareth had a physical body, that he therefore was not the Christ. And that is heresy. Yes. And yet these are the people who produced what came to be known as the, today in, in, in modern history, the critical text. Uh, now, of those 50 manuscripts we, we, that we know that Constantine commissioned, we think that two, maybe three, exist today. But the two most famous are a, a manuscript that, and I, I'm going to share with you the conventional wisdom, and then I'm going to share with you some more recent uh, things that have happened in the last several years, uh, discoveries. But the conventional wisdom is that one of those manuscripts was uh, uh, wound up at a, a monastery at the foot of Mount Sinai uh, called St. Catherine's uh, Greek Orthodox Monastery, which uh, in, in, particularly in the 19th century, and it's probably true to this day, was one of two major repositories of ancient documents in the Mediterranean world. Uh, the, the, the monastery at, at, at Mount Sinai. The other is the Vatican, by the way. But a man by the name of Tischendorf, who believed that the New Testament had been lost and his mission in life was to find all these ancient manuscripts, and the older the better, so that he could reconstruct the New Testament. Well, folks, I have an announcement to make. The New Testament was never lost. God has preserved not only His Word in general, but the very words. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word, as we heard this afternoon, that proceedeth forth out of the mouth of God. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words, notice plural, shall not pass away. We're talking about verbal preservation. But that's another topic we don't have time to, to deal with here at length tonight. Uh, but so one of these manuscripts wound up, at least the conventional wisdom has it, at, uh, the, at the, the, the monastery at uh, 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 Mount Sinai. And it was called Codex Sinaiticus. Just remember Sinaiticus. And you can remember Mount Sinai. That makes, that's easy to remember. The other major document was located at the Vatican, called Codex Vaticanus, the Book of the Vatican. And these, to this day, are the major uh, essence of the modern critical text. 
In fact, Vaticanus and, and Sinaiticus comprise about 98% of the, the, the modern critical text. And so we have Gnostics copying the text and them winding up, and, 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 and by the way, uh, St. Catherine's um, uh, Greek Orthodox monastery there at Mount Sinai is a bizarre place. It's been there for uh, probably 1,500 years. And as various monks uh, have, have served there and died there, they have kept their skulls, and they're all in a room stacked up. Isn't that true, Brother Brown? Yeah. He's been there and seen it. What a bizarre place. All the skulls of their, their, their forebearers. But anyway, that's where Sinaiticus came from. But we move to more recent history. And by that I mean in the last 400 years. Uh, men in Germany by the name of Jacob Sendler and uh, uh, John Jacob uh, Griesbach. Now I realize those are not household names and even for, for, for theological people you probably are not familiar with them. But Semler and Griesbach were the origins or the beginnings or the, the, uh, the, the root of what we today call liberalism and modernism or apostasy. They began a system called German rationalism. And it's the essence today of, of, of apostate theology, of liberal theology, of heretical theology. And they also advance early forms of the critical text. Well, getting back to Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, uh, they eventually made their way to England and to two British scholars by the name of Dr. Westcott and Dr. Hort. Uh, now, someone once alleged here some years ago that they were born again men, folks. If they were born again, the Pope's born again. Uh, I mean, when you read their history and their writings and what they really believed, they were apostates. But Vaticanus and Sinaiticus made their way, and for over a period of 30 years, on and off, uh, one was a, a bishop in the Church of England, the other was a professor, I think it was Oxford, maybe it was Cambridge, I forget which, uh, but a professor, and they, they collaborated together in producing and developing a new text of the New Testament based principally upon Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. And against the, the theory, the, the, the theory again is the oldest and the best manuscripts. They considered Vaticanus and, and Vaticanus the best, or, or Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, I should say, the best. And again, you notice the liberalism and the apostasy and the heresy. Well, Westcott and Hort were followed by other German liberals, such as the Nessels. Now, some of you preachers have heard of the nessel Alon text or the Nessel text. Uh, they were Germans. Uh, again, German rationalists. Uh, and when they died, an, another man by the name of Kurt Aland, and, and then his, also his wife Barbara, second wife, uh, I should say, uh, he was divorced and remarried, but uh, Kurt and Barbara Aland uh, continued to, to work with a critical text. Uh, when I was in seminary, we used the, uh, I think, the 23rd or 4th edition of the Nessel Aland text, which is one variety of the, the modern critical text. And coming to American shores then after World War II, there were men like Bruce Metzger, who went on to become the president of Princeton Theological Seminary, and he was a classic liberal, classic uh, uh, modernist, apostate. Others, such as Cardinal Martini of the Roman Catholic Church, these all collaborated and labored together to produce the, 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 the recent manifestations of, of the critical text. Either the Nestle Alon variety of it or the other side of it is called the United Bible Societies texts. The Nestle Alon text is in its 28th edition. That means that over approximately the last 100 years it has changed 28 times. Now, we print books, and, and we occasionally get into second and third editions of a book, and, and usually when a, a book goes into a second and third edition, it's because changes are being made. Usually typos are being corrected. Um, sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll adjust some, some information in a book, add some information, delete some information, but there are changes. Uh, the Nestle Alon text has changed 28 times in the last 100 years. I thought the Word of God never changed. The uh, United Bible Society text is in its fourth edition. 
And in, in recent decades, these two have been collated together, and, and, and this is where this NU business comes, the N for the Nestle Alon side and the U for the, the United Bible Society side, the NU text. But it's all essentially the same. Yeah. And, uh, but the lineage of the critical text, and, and remember this tonight, particularly students here, the lineage of the critical text is a who's who of heretics, apostates, and theological liberals versus missionaries and martyrs. What a difference. Well, a fourth area of difference between the critical text and the, the traditional text, and that is manuscript support. This is interesting. On the, tra uh, on the traditional text side, 99% of existing, or the technical word is extant manuscripts, support the traditional text. 99%. There are, the, 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 the conventional wisdom is there are 6,000 manuscripts that uh, scholars are aware of, and, and just recently Dr. Brown and others have been made aware of another 1,000 manuscripts at the scriptorium at Mount Athos, uh, adjacent to Thessalonica, or Thessalonica, however you want to pronounce it, in Greece, and they all are, support the traditional text. Now you, you do the numbers. Uh, the critical text comprises about 45 manuscripts. In reality, only two, and, and, and for all practical purposes, only one. 90% of the modern critical text is based upon Vaticanus, departing reluctantly to Sinaiticus, about 8%, and, and the other 2% from a variety of, of, of miscellaneous texts, and that's where the word eclectic comes from. But principally two manuscripts, Vaticanus, 90%, Sinaiticus, about 8%, versus six or 7,000 manuscripts supporting the traditional text. Isn't that interesting? But they, they reject the traditional text. They call it the Byzantine text. That's another general synonym for the, the, the traditional text. They reject the Byzantine manuscripts and consider them having the evidence of one because they all are supposedly later in their dating. Uh, but the vast majority of existing manuscripts today support the traditional text. Well, number five, a fifth reason here tonight, uh, or, or fifth uh, difference, I should say, between the critical text and the received text, and that is church usage versus the oldest and best mantra. And, and really, this is the nub of the debate right here tonight. The, the basis for acceptance of one or the other are one of these two rationales I'm about to present to you. The, the traditional text has been used by virtually all Bible-believing churches across the ages to this present day. It has been received by churches across the centuries to this present day. From the church at Antioch to the Waldenses to Tyndale to the modern fundamentalist movement, uh, the basic Bible has been traditional text Bibles. And on the English world, it's the King James Bible, which incidentally, and by the way, has more copies than any other Bible in the world. Uh, it's estimated that King James Bible has six billion copies in print. That's more than any other translation. That's more than all the rest put together. And either that is a fluke of history and a coincidence of history, or maybe God had something to do with that. And if we want, and, and by the way, I'm of the opinion, this is just for my, my I won't go into it here tonight, why, but I, I, it's, I'm of the opinion that 90% of fundamentalists today use the King James Bible. And, uh, and you hear the other side, and, and they make us think that we are the minority and that, that we are the the outliers, and that, and that we uh, are, well, the minority. But the fact is, I, in, in my view, in my opinion, 90% of fundamentalists, now I'm not talking about the evangelical mainstream, but 90% of fundamentalists still use the King James Bible. 
And if we want to play the oldest game, then there are fragments of Scripture supporting the traditional text which date to about 66 A.D. And the term received text, and its Latin version, text receptus, and its, its abbreviation TR, stems from the fact that virtually all Bible-believing churches through the ages have used the traditional text. They received it. In the year 1633, the Elsevier brothers in Holland, were, who were Bible printers, uh, proclaimed textum ab omnibus receptum, which is Latin, meaning a text now received by all. Now that's the first time the, 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 the term textum receptus appeared, and uh, uh, that was 100 years after Erasmus, but, but be that as it may. Now, on the other side, the critical text, their mantra is uh, that the, their Bibles, their translations, their, their text is based on the oldest and the best. As mentioned earlier, the, 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 we believe, we think, and, and there's reason to believe that uh, particularly Vaticanus was uh, through the commissioning of, of, of Constantine uh, to Eusebius to produce these old manuscripts, one of which is eventually wound up in the Vatican Library. I want to give you the, the non-conventional evidence of recent years. That, that's it's very interesting. And the claim of Vaticanus and, and Sinaiticus being the best manuscripts is almost ludicrous. In fact, it is ludicrous. Uh, Sinaiticus is a textual mess with thousands of obvious redactions, recensions, and changes. Uh, it, in fact, is one of the worst available manuscripts for ascertaining original form. It's a mess. And it, uh, it was pointed out last night that you can find more places where the, 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 the tech, or, or Sinaiticus and, and, and Vaticanus disagree than places where they agree. Uh, but here's what's, what's curious and what's developing as we speak. Uh, a man by the name of Constantine Simonides uh, claimed that Sinaiticus was in fact an old parchment that he found at Mount Athos in the year 1839. And he copied a, a Greek, other, uh, another Greek text and, 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 and that is what Sinaiticus is. In other words, a forgery. And he was producing it for the, uh, the Tsar of Russia to be sold, to make money on. And if that is true, and there is some very strong, and I believe credible evidence that supports that position, Amen. what we have in, in Sinaiticus is a counterfeit. <laughs> it's a forgery. And he... He treated the pages of the parchment to make it look like they were really old. Now, Vaticanus was first uh, indexed and recorded in the Vatican Library, if my memory serves me, in the year 1372, 14th century. And there are clear signs of Vaticanus having been overwritten in the 10th, 11th, and, and completely overwritten in the 15th century meaning it is virtually useless from a paleographic, that means a study of writing, or, 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 or of critical origins. It's not best by any stretch. And what we have here is very likely the, the, the essence of, again, forgery, or if you want to use the word, counterfeit. Now, over the years, I have I've made the, the remark that the, the critical text and critical text uh, translations are counterfeit. But I was speaking philosophically and figuratively and perhaps spiritually. But the evidence mounting now is that they were counterfeits physically. And the whole system of, of modern translations, whether it's the NIV or the ESV or the RSV, or all these modern translations are built on counterfeits, very possibly. That's amazing. Well, we must hasten. I, I, I'm, I'm not quite down to my final 10 or 15 seconds, uh, Brother Stringer. Uh, and then let me just skip uh, what I was going to say in point six. I've already basically said. But let me just take a few minutes here tonight and, and share with you 
alterations in the text. The, we've touched mainly on external associations of these texts, their, their, their origins, their editors, uh, whence they came and, and, and who's worked with them. But let's look a little bit into the text tonight. The fact of the matter is there are about 17 verses deleted out of the New Testament and scores of partial verses deleted. There are about 7,000 words deleted uh, in the critical text manuscripts as opposed to the text used by churches for thousands of years by thousands of manuscripts. And as mentioned, Gnostic influence I think is apparent particularly in Vaticanus, which we believe came from Alexandria. And there is a diminishing of the person of Jesus Christ in the critical text. For example, in Luke chapter 2 and verse 33 in the King James Bible, the traditional Bible, we read, and Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. All right. In the ESV, Luke 2.33 says, and his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. Hey, hold the phone there, folks. Was Joseph the father of Jesus? No, that's heresy. That is a direct denial of the virgin birth. That is a, 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 dimun, a diminution. That is a diminishing of the person of Jesus Christ. In Luke 6, 48, we read, And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon the house, and, they could not and it could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. ESV says, And when the flood arose, and the stream broke against that house, and could not shake it, because it had been well built. Well, Jesus is the rock. Once again, he's, he's, he's deleted. And I'm not particularly trying to pick on the ESV. They're just faithfully translating the critical text. So I'm going to say the ESV is a very faithful and accurate translation. Yes, it is. It's a faithful and accurate translation of the critical text, the counterfeit text. Acts 8.37. Uh, I believe Brother Brown pointed this out last night. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Uh, as, as Philip speak to the Ethiopian eunuch. That verse is entire, uh, in its entirety is omitted from the critical text. Again, a diminishing of the person of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 3.9, who created all things by Christ Jesus. ESV says, who created all things. Notice they've, they've deleted Jesus Christ as, as creator. Uh, I'm just hastening here. There's so many we could touch on, we don't have time. Revelation 1.11, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. ESV says, saying, uh, write what you see in a book. The leading, Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Uh, there is a disconnect in the critical text between Jesus as Lord and Jesus as Christ. Uh, Luke twenty two thirty one, 31, uh, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you. Uh, in the ESV, it just says, Simon, Simon, behold, Simon hath demanded uh, to have you. They leave out Lord, Lord. Luke 23, 42, and he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Uh, ESV says, and he said, Jesus, I re uh, remember me. They, they'll eat, Lord. Uh, our time is running. And, uh, and uh, uh, just a few other things here tonight where uh, uh, there's a disconnect between Jesus and Christ. And there are dozens and scores of these instances. I'm just giving you just a few examples. Uh, John 4, 42, and said unto the woman, Now we believe not because of the saying, but for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this indeed is the Christ, the Savior of the world. ESV says, For we have heard for ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Savior. Notice, a disconnect from Christ. Uh, John 6, 69, and we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. In the ESV it says, And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One. Again, disconnecting Jesus as Christ. And we can go on and on and on. Uh, I just don't have the time tonight. I promised Brother String I'd give him 15 seconds. But let me just summarize it here and we'll be done. The traditional text of the New Testament is the Word of God. The critical text is a corrupt counterfeit. The traditional text can be traced through Bible-believing people from Antioch to this present hour. The lineage of the critical text is a who's who of heretics, apostates, and unbelievers. 99% of the manuscripts support the traditional text. The mantra of the critical text is based upon, uh, it's based upon the oldest and the best, when in fact it's not the oldest, nor certainly is it the best. The critical text and its modern translations have clearly altered the text 
uh, whether it was done by Simonides or uh, somebody else, but it's clearly been altered and, and messed with in Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. Uh, number seven, there is a, a clear pattern of diminishing the person and work of Jesus Christ when you go look for it in critical text translations. And so students here tonight, particularly, I think the preachers here have already come to this conclusion, but students here tonight, just stay with the King James Bible. Maybe some of the details here have gone over you. You won't remember some of the dates and some of the names and, and things that I've, I've mentioned here tonight. But just remember, stay with the King James Bible because it is the Word of God in the English language. Father, thank You for Your Word. You've given us Your words and we have received them. And bless as we continue this evening and I ask it in Jesus' name.